The scripture reading this morning is from John chapter 6, 22 through 51. Please open your Bible to John chapter 6, 22 to 51. If using a pew Bible, the verses are found on pages 76 and 77 in the New Testament. Hear the word of the Lord. On the next, on the next day, the crowd which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other small boats came from Tiberias, near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What should we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Moses has not given you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him, and because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And also the bread which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Jesus came to give us true living bread from heaven to give his life for the world and those who eat of the bread that he came to give, as Jesus says here, they will never hunger, and they will never thirst. 
All kinds of yearnings exist in our souls, and we seek to satisfy those yearnings and those longings with things in the world, and the problem is those things will never satisfy, which is why you always have to have more. You've always got to run after more of the kind of bread that the world offers. Jesus says, you come to me, and you will find bread that truly satisfies. Those of you who know Christ, you know how true those words are. Those of you who don't know Christ in this room, Christ beckons you even now to come. To come and receive from his hand freely by his grace, without cost. You don't offer him anything to get this bread. He gives it freely to all who will come to him. So come. Stop resisting and fighting and just come. And you will find him to be the bread for your soul that truly satisfies you pray with me as we get into this text actually before we get into prayer there's one thing I need to I need to talk about Um, I don't want to be charged with ignoring the events that are taking place in the Middle East and not trying to shepherd us into uh, thinking about and praying through these matters Uh, so let me just for a moment um, offer some Encouragement to all of us as we seek to pray regarding what's happening with Israel and Gaza, Hamas, um, possibly Iran and um, other countries that may wind up getting involved. Um, There is great potential for global catastrophe uh, as we look at this situation. And I hope that you understand that you need to be praying that the Lord will work and accomplish his will through this situation. Now that may mean that global war breaks out because for some reason that is what he has decreed to come to pass in order to accomplish his will. What you need to be praying for and what I need to be praying for is that Christ would be magnified and exalted supremely through this horrific situation. Those of you who know some of the details, the gruesome and gory acts, atrocious acts that are being done to people, to human beings made in the image of God by other human beings made in the image of God. Uh, You should grieve not only that people would be suffering these kinds of brutal acts, but you you should be grieving that there are image bearers of God who are doing these acts to other people. It shows just the the emptiness of the worldview of Islam and uh, the view of God that exists within that religion. Um, Pray for the world. Yes, pray for Israel. But you pray for them that they'd be humbled and that they would recognize their true Messiah who has come. Pray that they would become the covenant people of God, because right now they are not. They are outside the new covenant that has surpassed and come in place of the old. They need to repent of their sins, and they need to recognize Jesus Christ as Lord and as Messiah and as Savior. And the way that many of the Jewish people treat Christians in Israel today ought to have us praying more for the Christians in those lands than for the Jews. Some of you don't recognize the persecution that Christians are enduring even within the lands of Israel. The true covenant people of God are suffering all around the world. How about in Azerbaijan? Just made aware of 120,000 displaced Armenian Christians who are suffering persecution at the hands of the government in Azerbaijan. The military has already attacked this, this group and killed over 400 people. Did you hear anything about that? This just happened in September. Why don't we pray for them too? Right? Pray for the, the peace of God's church. That's what we're to be praying for in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Praying for kings and all those in authority so that the church may dwell in peace 
and have the opportunity to, to move forward accomplishing the will that Christ, the, the, the commission that Christ has given us. I, I want to encourage you, yes, pray for Israel. Yes, pray for the events that are going on over there. Pray for the, 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 the impact that that might have upon the world. Pray that we would be ready to meet the challenges that that might even bring upon us here in Stillwater. Yes, pray for all of that. But pray for God's persecuted people around the world who are going to be caught up in all of this. Pray for your brothers and sisters who are going to suffer at the hands of both Jews and Muslims. Pray for them. And pray for Christ's coming to be soon. Uh, now let's pray together. Father, we do pray that you would... that you would exalt the name of Jesus over all the earth, Lord, so that the glory of, of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We thank you, Lord, for all the ways that you are now extending the scepter of Christ into foreign lands, lands of your enemies, and claiming a people for your own possession. Lord, we thank you that the gospel is going forth even now, and even now your people are being made willing in the day of your power. Not only willing to serve you with their lives, but willing to lay their lives down in service of your cause. Lord, I pray that you would be with your people as they suffer throughout this world. I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage their hearts in the truth, that they would not love their lives even unto death as they seek to hold fast and true to the word of, of their testimony and to the blood of the Lamb. God, I pray that you would grant them the courage and the strength to know that the victory comes through suffering and that it's given to them the privilege of suffering for the sake of Christ, not only believing in his name, but to suffer on his behalf. That is a gift that you have given them. You've counted them worthy of suffering for the name. And I pray that you would encourage their hearts with that truth as you did the apostles in the book of Acts. Father, we do not know the kind of persecution that our brothers and sisters experience around the world. We don't know what it's like, but we do sense opposition and hostility to, to your truth and to our king growing in our own lands. And we know that it's becoming more costly for us to publicly identify as soldiers of the king, as servants of the savior. And Lord, I pray that we would not shirk away and shrink away in disbelief and doubt, but that we would stand firm in faith, resolute in our day, that you would strengthen us with boldness, Lord, in our spirit, so that we might proclaim Christ the way he ought to be proclaimed to our family members, and to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to the people in, in the street and in the store. God, that we would be unashamed to herald the name of Christ, <laughs> the name of Jesus that saves. God, I pray we would not be ashamed of that. And forgive us for the ways that we have proven to be ashamed of that name. Lord, sanctify us for your sake. Help us stand fast in these times for your glory, for the name of Christ. And Lord, I pray as we come into John 6, I pray that you would help us taste the bread of life. That you would give us grace to come and to be satisfied in our Lord Jesus Christ, this bread who has come down from heaven to give life to the world. Help us know that life, Lord, and help us live that life out through our days as we journey home and sojourn home to be with you. God, we pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the title today is uh, The Bread of Life, and that was titled, that title was chosen because I thought we were going to get further in the passage today than we were actually going to get. So today we're, we're really only going to focus on verses 22 to 29, and um, what we're going to be looking at is, is the, really the work of faith. What does Jesus mean when he talks about the work of faith? Um, laboring for the bread that endures to eternal life. What is he talking about whenever he speaks that way? That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Now, some preliminary 
comments, I guess, before we get into the passage. We've already looked at two of the miracles that Jesus performs in John chapter 6. One is the feeding of the 5,000, and the other is walking on water in the midst of the, the, the windstorm upon the waves coming to his disciples. Now today what we're going to get into is Jesus' explanation of the significance of the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus is going to start explaining to these Jews who had experienced the blessing of being fed, right? Jesus multiplying the bread and the fish on their behalf. They who had experienced that miracle, Jesus is going to start explaining to them the significance of that miracle. What they should have taken away from the miracle that he performed. And as we walk through this this chapter, just remember, as Jesus is explaining the significance of that miracle, that means that that miracle was a sign. It was a sign that was pointing to something greater than itself, right? And that's what Jesus is unpacking for us in the rest of John 6. Now, there's a progression in this chapter as as we move through the passage. It opens with this crowd of people who had, who had been fed by Jesus, seeking after him. They're chasing him down, and they're going to great lengths to find him. Where is Jesus? We need to find him. They cross the Sea of Galilee and find him in Capernaum. And once they find him, they begin to inquire of him. Lord, when did you get here? They're inquisitive. They're wondering. They're wanting to know more about Jesus and what he's done, what has happened, and how he got there. But then... As Jesus begins to teach them what they should have taken away from that miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, that leads them to grumbling, that leads this crowd to begin arguing amongst themselves and stumbling in disbelief over and against the teaching that Jesus is giving. And it ultimately ends with this crowd that had been seeking him at the beginning, all but 12 people determined that they are going to depart from him. They're going to withdraw and no longer follow him. That's a progression. So it it progresses from this exuberant expression of false faith, and it ends with the hollowness of that false faith. It leads them to departing from the Messiah. Now, what I want to point out here from the beginning is that it's no accident that that crowd chooses to depart from Jesus in response to Jesus' teaching. It's not like Jesus gave this teaching and they were just not truly understanding what he was saying. No, they understood what he was saying, and that's what made them leave. And I want you to understand something that wasn't an accident. Jesus didn't accidentally offend this crowd and, and lead to them withdrawing from him. He purposefully taught them the gospel in such a way that they would be offended by it if they weren't true believers. Well, we need to take that to heart in our day. There's an important lesson for us to learn from that. That Jesus wields the good news of the gospel against this crowd in such a way that it causes them to leave. And he does it on purpose. You know, on one level, in our day and in a much quieter way than what I would like, (laughs) in a much more subtle way, in in our day we, we have seen true believers growing disillusioned with the evangelical clown show. And I'm grateful for that. We see true believers coming out of the ridiculousness of Big Eva and and the liberal churches that all defame the name of Christ by preaching a false gospel, a gospel of social justice and homosexuality and approval and love for everyone regardless of whether they repent or not. That is not the gospel of the New Testament. It's not the gospel that Jesus Christ died in order to present to us. I'm thankful that in our day we, 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 we see true believers recognizing the shallowness of what false religions are offering them in the name of Christ, and they're trying to come to churches where the Word of God is just being open and faithfully proclaimed, as imperfectly as that proclamation might be. That's us here at Oak Ridge, right? Imperfect proclamation, but we're trying to be faithful to what Jesus has given us in His Word. 
I'm thankful for that. But at the same time, there's a much more noticeable, and in a much more noticeable way, we have seen increased expressions of apostasy taking place all around us. And I think as believers, we can see the apostasy, the the departing from Christ happening all around us, and we can be tempted to think that somehow that's a reflection on the powerlessness of the gospel to meet our, our, our needs in our day. Somehow we can think that times have changed, people have changed, and the gospel in and of itself is no longer enough to meet the challenges that people are facing today. So we've got to come up with something new. We have to repackage that gospel in a way that it will attract attention and people will actually open it. We don't need to get involved in any of that in order to understand what Jesus is doing in our day in the midst of the great apostasy that we're experiencing. What Jesus is doing today is exactly what we see him doing here in John 6. As the gospel is clearly and more accurately proclaimed in our day, the dividing line between those who truly are his disciples and those who are not his disciples is going to become more clear. It's as the gospel is clarified that the light of the gospel shines upon the emptiness and shallowness of false faith. Really what it is, what Jesus is doing in our own day is exactly what he's doing here. He's culling the herd. He's separating out the true disciples from those who are not true disciples and he's using his gospel to do it. That's amazing to me. Right? It, it It is an aroma of life to those who by the power of God are called to see Jesus Christ and and his crucifixion as the power of God for salvation. The gospel is an aroma of life to those who are being saved. But the gospel is a powerful stench in the nostrils of people who are on their way to hell. I just want to encourage you, despite the gravity, the the, 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 uh, the heavy tone that I have here, I want to encourage you not to lose heart in our day. You share the gospel with people, you preach Christ with people, and they don't respond, they don't come to Jesus. Don't be tempted to think that that's somehow the gospel uh, lose, ha- having lost its power or, or is not as, as, as mighty as Jesus says it is in the Word. No, it's just that Jesus is using that gospel in a specific way in our day. He's using that gospel to whittle out Whittle down to the true disciples who are really following him. To separate those who are just playing games. That's that's what's happening in our day. That's what we see Jesus doing here in John chapter 6. Now that was just supposed to be a parenthesis. Our outline for today, what we're going to do is we'll look through uh, verses 22 to 29. First of all, we have two main points. First of all, there's a rebuke from Christ towards these people, a rebuke for these people who are seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons. And then secondly, the second main point, there's an exhortation, an exhortation to work for the food that does not perish. Now first, let's look at that rebuke that Jesus gives to this crowd that's seeking after him. Look with me at verse, beginning in verse 22. Verse 22 opens saying, the next day, that is the day after Jesus fed this crowd with the miracle, the day after Jesus sent his disciples across the sea, the day, or at least I would say the, the, later on in the day when Jesus walked on the water and went to the boat. On that day, the crowd began looking for Jesus, but they couldn't find him. They knew that he had not cro- uh, crossed the lake in the boat because there was only one boat on the shoreline the night before. And they saw the disciples get in that boat and start crossing the lake without Jesus. So they knew that Jesus didn't go with him, with them. Their assumption was, Jesus is still here somewhere. We need to go find him. So they start searching around, and they can't find him. Now, apparently that morning, there were some boats that had arrived uh, from the city of Tiberias, verse 23. That's, that's on the direct opposite side of, of the Sea of Galilee, by the way directly opposite from where they were. Some boats arrived, and probably because they heard of all the miracles that Jesus was doing, and they wanted to see and experience 
what was going on for themselves. Uh, so they arrive, and when they, with this crowd, couldn't find Jesus, some within the crowd decided to go into the boats and to go search for Jesus somewhere else. Now, verse 24 tells us they decided to go to Capernaum. Do you know why they went to Capernaum? It seems like a shot in the dark, right? Like, why Capernaum? Well, Matthew 4.13 tells us that Jesus had actually made Capernaum his home, his home base during his ministry in Galilee and, and actually his whole earthly ministry. And so they thought to themselves, we can't find Jesus here. Maybe they saw his disciples head off in that direction and they're thinking, our best bet is to go to Capernaum because that's where Jesus is most of the time. Verse uh, 25, it tells us that they guessed right because when they arrived, they found him and they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now you notice in verse 26, Jesus does not answer their question. In classic Jesus style, he leaves them hanging. At least he didn't answer their question the way they wanted him to. They were intrigued. They were wondering, Lord, how did you get here? When did you come here? Because we didn't see you get in the boat. <laughs> and unless you stayed up all night long walking you know, the 10 to 15 miles around the shoreline to get to Capernaum, I don't, we don't know how else you would have gotten here. And you can hear within that question, there's, a, there's, a, there's this curiosity that's coming out of them. It's probably the same kind of curiosity that motivated them to start following Jesus to begin with. You remember in John 6, verse 2, the only reason why this crowd was following Jesus was because of the signs that they saw Jesus doing. So it seems as though, as they come here to Jesus again, they're seeking a better understanding of some sign, some miracle that he may have done in order to cross the lake and get over to where he was now. That's how most commentators understand their question anyway. They asked him, when did you get here? And how did Jesus respond? Not by telling them when he got there, not by telling them how he got there, but exposing why they had come there. They want to know, when did you get here? He says, why are you here? Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 26, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, it's obvious Jesus doesn't entertain their question because he knew it was, it was being asked from wrong motives. You know, many might have seen this kind of situation as an opportunity to advance their cause and to gain a greater following for themselves. I can think of big name, big Eva pastors being set down in a situation like this and and, and they're not going to ignore the question. They're going to entertain the question in order to keep this crowd following them. Right? This is an opportunity for us. Jesus doesn't see it that way. If he wanted to, he could have wowed them with the story of how he crossed the lake. Right? He could have said, no, no, yeah. I got here because actually, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, but, but I'm going to tell you because it's pretty amazing. Actually, last night, I just decided that I was going to walk on water. Yeah, you know, that windstorm came through, and I'm just, I just determined, I'm going to walk on water. I'm going to get in the boat with my disciples, and that's how I got here. He could have wowed them with that story, but he chose not to do that. In fact, if he wanted to, he could have coddled their superficial devotion to him by praising them for going to such lengths to seek him out. Man, you guys must really want to be with. Look what you did to, to come find me. Good job. Good job, crowd. Jesus doesn't do that either. Now, why doesn't he do that? Why does he not entertain their question? Why does he not even acknowledge the sacrifice that many of them had made in order to follow him around for a number of days and then to cross the lake to find him in Capernaum? Why doesn't he even acknowledge those things? Well, I think it's because... Jesus demands something deeper from those who would be his disciples than mere fascination with his miracles or shallow devotion to him based upon the material blessings he might give them. 
Jesus demands more from those who would be his followers than a mere superficial fascination with his miracles or some uh, superficial desire to follow him. Jesus is after true faith in their hearts, and they definitely can't get there if he's catering to and pandering to their carnal interest. Instead, he exposes the true state of their hearts. He says, you're not seeking me because you saw signs. That is, you're not seeking me because you understand the significance of what you saw. You're only seeking me because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Now, that word filled there is very interesting. Very interesting word choice. That word was used in Greek culture to refer to animals who would gorge themselves on fodder. You know, like when you're fattening up, Chris, when you're fattening up one of your cows for the slaughter, that's what this word, you would use this word to describe that. So it's as if Jesus says to this crowd, you're only following me because yesterday you pigged out on bread. Bunch of animals. See, Jesus saw through their outward appearance of devotion, their outward appearance of devotion, And he saw that in their hearts they were only seeking him for the same reason that an ox might seek after the one who's feeding it. There's no real heartfelt devotion in them. There's no sincere attachment to him as the Son of God and Savior of the world. There's no true enlightenment in their hearts to see who he really is. All they could see was what he could do and how useful that was to them. Just a desire to come to him to have their carnal lusts satisfied. Now that's probably, honestly, that probably sounded a little offensive when Jesus used this word with them. Maybe even cutting. Right? He definitely didn't say to this crowd what church growth experts would have told him to say in that kind of situation. But he did say exactly what needed to be said in order to jar them out of their sensual carnality and to confront them with the true state of their souls. I don't know if you know this. If you're a Christian in this room, you do know this. When the Spirit of God begins to work in your heart and apply the truth of the Word of God to you, it cuts. It stings. It hurts. It crushes you. Because what it does is it takes your perception of who you are It takes your idea of how good you are and how God must be pleased with you and it crushes it under the weight of the Gospel. It says, no, you're not good actually because there's no one who is good. There's not even one. No, you weren't seeking after God because there's no one who seeks after Him. Romans 3. You were conceived in iniquity. In sin you were brought forth. You were going astray from God from the womb. See, when the Spirit of God comes and awakens you to see the reality of who you are through the eyes of God, it hurts. Because it's crushing that idol of self and it's showing how that idol does not compare with the Lord of glory. There's a Lutheran commentator, Linsky. He wrote the following on that thought. He said, people do not like to hear what their real spiritual condition is. You ever notice that? When you start talking with someone about the true state of their heart, they get very defensive. They don't like talking about what the true state of their spiritual condition is. He says, shams are so popular, but truth alone saves, even though it is bitter. And when the Lord wants to save someone, he allows them to taste the bitterness of the truth the bitterness of the gospel, so that the sweetness of the gospel is received. Right? That you are a condemned, wretched sinner in the eyes of God, and yet he has loved you such that he sent his son to be your savior. The only taste that sweetness when you've got a mouthful of bitterness. There are many people, perhaps even some in this room, who like this crowd are only seeking Jesus because of the things that they want him to give them, 
right? Some people, I think, only seek Jesus because they think Jesus is the key to living a, a healthy, happy life. Jesus is the key to having money. Jesus is the key to success. Jesus is the key to escaping from suffering and trial and pain. But you know, to seek Jesus in that way, you know what you're turning Jesus into, or at least what you're trying to turn him into? You're trying to turn him into your own personal lackey to do what you want him to do. And Jesus will not be a servant to desires like that. In fact, if you are truly his, Jesus will do with you the same things that he did with the Israelites. Remember what he did with the Israelites when he was leading them through the wilderness? Jude 5 says it was Jesus who delivered them out of Egypt, right? So as Jesus was leading them through the wilderness, you remember what he did with them? He humbled their souls for 40 years. How did he humble them? Well, he let them hunger. And he chose not to give them the bread that they were wanting. And he's going to do the same thing with us who are truly his people in this room. He's going to give us bread that we don't know. Bread that we don't want. Trials we wouldn't ask for. Hardships that we were not wanting. Jesus is going to do all of that in our lives because that is the only way that we will learn that ultimately we don't live on bread alone, but we live on the word of God that is given to us. Now, praise the Lord that he doesn't rip out of our hands all of our idols and false desires at once. It's a, it's a process, little by little. It's called sanctification. But the Lord will deliberately choose not to satisfy many of the desires we have because that is how he weans us off of our selfish propensity to seek him for the wrong reasons. He chooses not to satisfy many of our desires Because that is his means of keeping us from spiritual danger. You don't know. Some of the things that you want Jesus to do for you may be the very things that would end your soul in hell. And Jesus in his love is going to keep them from you. And not give you all of those desires that you might be asking him to do. Now this crowd that was definitely seeking Jesus for the wrong reasons. Seeking after the wrong kind of bread. And he rebukes them. For that, But he follows that with an exhortation. You see this beginning in verse 27. This, there are two parts to this. He says to the crowd in verse 27, first of all, do not work for the food which perishes. Do not work for the food which perishes. That's an exhortation. Now there was one reason this crowd was still seeking after Jesus. They wanted him to give them more bread. All they were seeking for him to do was give them more of the bread that perishes. By the way, that's the same motivation that was behind their desire to make him their king, right? They wanted a carnal king who would be set over a carnal kingdom that would satisfy all of their carnal expectations of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, no, I'm not that kind of king. And my kingdom is not that kind of kingdom. It's that same desire manifesting here as they're seeking Jesus for more bread. They have a carnal desire. They have a lust to use the Lord to get something that they want. And Jesus will not submit to that. In fact, He exhorts them, do not labor for the food that perishes. Why are you spending yourself for food that's only going to last the moment that you eat it? Right? I mean, they had just been fed to their full the day before. Right? It says in John, uh, what is it, 6.11 or 6.12, that they ate as much as they wanted. And there was many, much bread left over. They had glutted themselves on the provision that the Lord had given them. And what happened the very next day? All of that bread's gone. No longer satisfying. They've got hunger in their stomachs. And Jesus tells this crowd, stop laboring. Stop spending all of your energies to gain bread that's only going to perish in the using of it. Even now, Jesus says the same thing to the vast majority of people in this world, maybe even to some of you, who spend their best efforts laboring to attain food that will one day perish. 
right? They spend their lives just to get the next job promotion, to capitalize on the right investment, to get the right politician in office. They give themselves in pursuing the right college degree and having the nice car and buying the right kind of home and having the successful career and the money and the boat and the cabin and the camper and the approval of all their friends and family. The right spouse, good sex, pleasure in all of life, vacations. There are people who only live for that proverbial weekend, right? Spend all of their lives laboring to save up for retirement so they can then finally enjoy something of life before they check out. And Jesus stands before everyone like that and says, what good does any of that do when it really counts? You can have a bank account filled with millions of dollars and you can go off and enjoy all kinds of vacations in your retirement, but the day's going to come when you're going to take your last breath and you are going to pass into eternity. At that moment, what will you have spent your life on? Will it have been on anything that's going to endure beyond that last breath that you take? Will you have given any of your life to pursuing true living bread that will carry you throughout the the eternity that's coming? Or have you spent your whole life on things that that will slip through your hands? when you exit this world and stand before the Lord for judgment. Jesus says, stop laboring for food that perishes. Isaiah 55, 2, why? Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages on that which does not satisfy? Well, we all know what it's like to spend ourselves seeking after sin, the bread that the world has to offer, seeking after sin and, and finding that it never satisfies. Why do you spend your entire lives seeking things that ultimately will rot? Mark chapter 8, verse 37, Jesus says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? What what difference does it make if God gives you everything you could possibly want in this world? If at the end of it all, your soul perishes with all those things? What good does that accomplish? 2 Peter 3.10 The day of the Lord will come like a thief. And in that day, the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. See, on that day when Jesus returns like a thief in the night, it's all getting burned up. Retirement accounts, homes, businesses, cars, uh, adulterous relationships, uh, uh, fornication, uh, entertainment, Uh, football, baseball, like it's all getting burned up on the day that Jesus comes. So what good is it going to do your soul if on the day that Jesus comes, you're so busy clinging to these things that you aren't actually holding fast to Him? What good does that do? Because in in the destruction of those things, you will be destroyed with them. You understand that. That's bread that perishes. And Jesus says, stop spending yourself. Stop laboring for bread that's only going to perish one day. Rather, secondly, Jesus exhorts them in verse 27, work for the food that endures to eternal life. Right? There is true, enduring, lasting food that will sustain those who eat it throughout the days of eternity. And Jesus says, rather than spending yourselves on what will not last, work for that food. Give your life to pursuing that food, the food that's going to last, the food that will stay with you when you pass out into eternity. Spend your days seeking that food. And then he gives them a promise. He says, and I will give that food to you because on me the Father has set his seal. 
Right? That's what gives us hope and confidence to come to Jesus and to receive the food that he has to give, to seek the food that will not perish and that will endure for all eternity because on him the Father has set his seal. He anointed him with his Holy Spirit. Jesus went about teaching about the Father and the kingdom of God with power and authority. He performed all the signs and the wonders uh, for the sake of his Father. All of that was the Father attesting that he had set his seal on his Son, climaxing in that final, full demonstration of his seal upon him in the resurrection of Christ from the dead. On Him the Father has set His seal. And Jesus says, I have the authority to give you the kind of bread that will endure to the end of your life and beyond. You must come to Me if you're going to have it. And I will give it to you. The Father guarantees I'll give it to you. Jesus says, you spend, you spend yourself seeking me to have this bread, and I promise you, I will give it to you. The Father's seal upon him is what gives us confidence to know that his promise is true. Now, I hate to break it right there, but we're going to look next week at what that bread is that Jesus promises that he will give to us. But for the rest of the time, I want to consider two questions that Jesus' comments here bring up, at least in my mind. Two questions that these statements of Jesus in verse 27 in verse, uh, in verse 27 bring up. Number one, is Jesus calling people to earn eternal life when he tells them to labor for the food that does not perish? He says in verse 27, work not for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures. Work for the food that endures. Is Jesus calling us to live a life of works so that we might gain the food that endures? Well, no, simply put, because Jesus says, I will give that food to you. You can't earn a gift. If Jesus is going to give it, we are not earning it. But in history, there have been many people who have understood Jesus' statement to mean we must work in order to gain eternal life. Probably most notably is the Roman Catholic Church, right? Grace alone is not sufficient to save. You must cooperate with that grace doing certain kinds of works, and then you will be saved. Mormons say the same thing, right? Mormonism, it says we are saved by grace after all we can do. So you do everything you can do, and at the end of that, whatever's lacking, God's grace is going to come alongside and make it good. That's not the grace of the Bible. Jehovah Witnesses believe the same thing. It's important they don't deny the need for grace. They just deny that grace alone is sufficient to save you. God's willing to give grace for salvation, but only to those who will do the right kind of works in order to have it. So do these works, and you will receive grace. Earn, then receive. That's what these false cults and entities would say, organizations. And they'll point to statements like what Jesus says here in John 6, and they'll say, well, that's what Jesus is teaching right there. See, he says, you work, and I'll give. That's even how the Jews here in John 6 understood Jesus' statement too, isn't it? You look in verse 28, Jesus said to them, work for the food that endures to eternal life. And how did they respond? They said, okay, fine. Well, you just tell us what works we need to do so that we can be doing the works of God. And we'll do it. What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? That is, if we need to work for the food that endures to eternal life, then you just tell us what those works need to be, and we'll go forth and do them, and we'll get eternal life from you. Now, Jesus makes clear in verse 29, though, that they had missed the point. He says, this is the work of God. Not law, not commandment, not earning your way into my grace and favor. No, this is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He sent. 
In other words, this is all that God expects from you, Jews. And I'll say this to you all sitting here in this room. This is what God expects from you as well. Are you still with me? Just shake your head. You still here? We're all still in the same room. We're all still paying at least a little bit. We're paying attention. Pay attention here. Because Jesus is not only saying this to this crowd, He's saying this to you. Every single one of you in this room. It is not about your works that's going to get you into into eternal life or let you earn or receive the, the bread that endures to eternity. It's not about how good of a person you are. I know people who think if I just keep the Ten Commandments, if I just do my best, God's going to accept me in the end and it's all going to be okay. What a shock and what a surprise when the Lord looks at them and compares them to His Son and says, you didn't measure up. You should have come to Him as your refuge rather than standing on your own. Jesus says, this is what God expects from you. This is what you must do. You must believe in Me. That is, you must receive Me. You must cast yourself upon Me. You must feed upon Me. You must put all of your hope for life and eternity in Me and in Me alone. Renouncing hope in everything else and putting hope in Him alone. See, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And to put faith in Christ alone means nothing less than completely committing all that we are and all that we hope for for time and eternity into His faithful hands. Lord, I believe who You are. I trust in Your saving work, living the righteous life I could not live, dying the atoning death for my sin that I could never make up before God, rising again from the dead as my conquering Savior, coming back one day as my returning King. I believe in who You are and I'm putting all of my eggs in that basket. I'm going to swing out into eternity holding on to that slender thread. I'm going to put all of my hope for standing before God and finding acceptance with Him in the work that Jesus Christ has done on my behalf. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. It doesn't just mean that you have a notional concept that Jesus was a real person. Or that He actually literally died. Or even that He rose again from the dead. None of that's going to help you when you stand before God. The devil knows all those things are true. What matters is are you putting your trust in what Jesus has done? Right, I, I know this analogy is way overused. I think it was Billy Sunday who, who started this or something like that. If you know who that is. It does no good to know all the, the specs and the information about the pew that you're sitting in. Right? Or a chair. It does no good to know everything about that chair and to be able to say notionally, yeah, that chair will hold me up. I believe that. Well, you know, you got to put your money where your mouth is. you you got to let the rubber meet the road and find out what happens. You actually have to go sit down in that chair if you're going to truly believe that that chair can hold you up. Very similar way, it's the same with Christ. You can say that you believe and you know and understand all these truths about the Lord Jesus, but until you actually take your soul and put it in His hands and say, Lord, I am committing myself utterly to You, You have not yet trusted Him. Faith is a giving up of ourselves to Christ. And that is the work of being a disciple. This is all that God expects from us. Commit ourselves to His Son. 1 John 3.21, it says the same thing. It says, the commandment from the Father that must precede obedience to every other commandment is that we believe in the name of God. Of his son. And by the way, this is why Romans 1 5, this is why the the whole Christian life is described as the obedience of faith for his namesake. Because obeying the gospel is obeying the command to believe in Christ, giving your life to that. Now, so it's not, Jesus isn't calling us to earn or work for eternal life because faith is not. Faith is not earning eternal life, but that leads to a second question, maybe a clarifying question. If Jesus isn't teaching that we earn our way to eternal life by working for it, 
then is Jesus teaching us that faith is a work that must be done? Right? He tells us in this passage, he speaks, in, he speaks of faith in terms that make some people think or wonder whether faith itself is a work. So in verse 27, he says, work for the food that endures to eternal life, right? And then he defines what that work is. That work is believing in me. So does that mean that faith becomes a work in the Christian life the way that the law is a work? Right? So like, if you wanted to earn salvation by the works of the law, you go and do the works of the law, and then you will get salvation. Is that the way it is with faith? Like, Faith has now become the commandment, the work that we have to do in order to get salvation. Is that the way this works? Now you may be, I may have lost you on that, but there are a lot of people who think that. They think that they're going to be accepted before God because they have done the work of believing in Jesus. Now that's not putting hope in Christ. That's putting hope in your choice to believe. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. He's not describing faith as a work, and let me explain why I see that. We're coming to a close, so just be patient, okay? First of all, we know that this is not, faith is not a work in the way that the law is a work because the rest of Scripture teaches us that faith is a disposition before it is an action. Faith is a disposition of the soul before it is an action of the heart or mind. So Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says that before faith can ever be an action, it must first be an internal assurance and conviction of the reality of things that we hope for and yet do not see. Do you see that? Faith is not a decision primarily. It's an internal disposition. It's a, it's a conviction of the heart of the things that are real. You must have a conviction in your own heart of things that are real and yet unseen or else you will not believe in them. You can't make yourself believe in something you can't see. Faith is an internal disposition of the heart before it is an action. It's not fundamentally a work. Fundamentally, it's a change in our core convictions about what is true. That's what faith is. And then our outward behavior begins to conform to that internal conviction. However, that does not mean that faith is effortless. Okay, and I want to end on this encouragement. I hope, I hope it's an encouragement. <clears throat> Christ describes faith in this chapter in terms of labor because it truly is an all-consuming effort to believe in Jesus Christ. Believing in Christ is not merely a decision that you made 30 years ago. Believing in Christ is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment activity of putting yourself in Christ's saving hands and leaving yourself there. He describes it as a labor because faith in Christ requires, listen, listen to this, true faith in Christ requires the reallocation and the redirection of all of our time and energies and efforts away from the pursuits of the things of the world and to the pursuit of Christ. So just as fervently as you used to pursue sin in your life prior to coming to Christ, all that characterized you in your pursuit of sin, all of that should be taken off of that pursuit of sin and engaged in your pursuit of Jesus. That's living a life of faith. And we see that play out in the Scriptures, right? The Apostle Paul was fervent in his pursuit in, 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 uh, in condemning Christ and persecuting the church. And yet when he's converted, we see him just as fervently serving the Lord and serving His kingdom and building up the church. That should be all of us. It is a labor. It is a labor. But, but it's a glorious labor. It's a free labor. It's a labor of liberty. John Calvin, he said that the spiritual food of the soul is the free gift of Christ and 
We must strive with all the affections of our heart to become partakers of so great a blessing. The gift is free, but we must engage all of our affections in our pursuit of that gift in order to enjoy it. The scriptures speak this way all over the place, and I'll try to just summarize these things. But in Luke 13, 23 through 24, a man came to Jesus asking, Lord, are there a few who are, are there just few who are being saved? And Jesus turns the spotlight back on the man who asked the question, and he says, don't you worry about what, whether anyone else is going to get into the heaven, in, into the kingdom of God. You worry about whether you're getting in, right? So don't worry about everyone else, but you strive to enter into the narrow door. That word strive, the, the Greek word there is agonizomai. Do you hear an English word in that? Agonize. You agonize to enter into that narrow door. You know, if you're going to agonize over something, it really is all-consuming, isn't it? It takes up all your mind, all your thoughts, all your disposition of heart. It's all geared towards that one thing that you're agonizing over. Jesus says you agonize to enter into that narrow door. The narrow door is Christ. Entering in is entering in through, into Christ by faith. And Jesus says it's striving that ensures that you actually get into that door. 1 Timothy 6.12, Paul describes the Christian life as fighting the good fight of faith. It's not just a passive existence. It's an active engagement. It's a battle. It's something that you are fighting to achieve. It's a good fight, but it's a fight nonetheless. And you notice what he says there. You, you fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. He's not taking hold of something to which he has not yet been called. He is taking hold of that to which God has called him. The invitation has come. The inheritance is already Timothy's. Now Paul is telling Timothy, now you spend the rest of your life laboring to take hold of it. To live in its fullness. To walk in its possession. Until the day when you receive the fullness of inheritance in Christ's presence. Philippians 3, 8-12. through This is like the clearest passage, right? Describing what it means not to work for the food that perishes, but to work for the food that endures to eternal life. Paul exemplifies that for us right here in Philippians 3. Right? It, it involves the, 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 the letting go of, of everything else in life in order to attain true spiritual knowledge of Christ. Uh, the letting go of everything so that Paul says in verse 8, that I may gain Christ, that I might have him that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. Paul says, I let go of everything in order to experience that glory. Verse 12, he says, for this I'm striving, I'm striving after this to lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ. That was Paul's life. Jesus had laid hold of him, had designated him for eternal glory, and Paul says, I'm spending the rest of my life pursuing that that I might take hold of it myself. Verse 14, I spend my life pressing on, straining forward to grab a hold of the prize of being called upward to glory by God through Christ Jesus. I wonder if you view the Christian life like that. Are you passively waiting around for your sanctification to come to its fullness? Or are you actively engaged in seeking to become more greatly conformed to the image of God the Son? Now, the crowd, was not willing, the crowd was willing to do a lot. Just tell us what we need to do to do the works of God, and we'll do them. But they weren't willing to believe in Christ. Let me end on this. Next week, we're going to talk about why they weren't willing to believe on Christ. And surprisingly, it may be a little shocking because we're talking about Jewish people but surprisingly, Jesus says they were not believing in him because they had not been chosen by God and given to the Son. They did not believe because they were not given. We're going to see that next week. Otherwise, they would come. But I'll end on this. What are you working for in your life? What are you spending your life on? Your life will be over far sooner than you anticipate.
And when it is over, what will you have spent your whole life earning? Will it be the things of the world or will it be the one thing that counts for eternity? Knowing Christ and being found in Him. Now you all know where you are pursuing more of the things of the world than you are pursuing Christ. You know in your own life right now, believer, where you are not pursuing Christ the way you should, but you're pursuing things of the world. Here is Jesus' invitation to you. Repent. Stop laboring for the food that perishes and come to him. Labor for the food that endures to eternal life, which he will give to everyone who renounces their own works. They're working for the bread that perishes and come in simple faith to him to have it. May that be you. May that be me. Let's pray together. Lord, the path that you call us to walk down is a simple path, but it's a costly path. It's a simple path. It's believing in you as the gift of heaven, as the bread who has come down to give life to the world. But to walk down that path requires that we die to ourselves daily, that we get on the cross and take it up and follow you unto death. Lord, I pray that you would fill our hearts with an ability to do that very thing. Lord, give us great joy in living our lives for you and seeking you. Give us ambition to know you above all else. May we be those, may we be found on that last day being those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, may we be found in him on that day Help us now as we praise you, as we respond to the message. Help us sing with full hearts and joy. We ask this in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Here, a benediction from Jude, verses 1 and 2. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. May the Lord fulfill that in your own heart and life in the week ahead. Amen. Amen. May he go on his peace.